All right. Well, thanks for being here. This is great. I appreciate, first of all, the uh, kind invitation from DP Review to do this. Uh, it's my honor to do this, and uh, I'm hopeful and you guys will feel the same way. Uh, reframe. What a great term for what this is. It's a really good time to come to a conference where you reframe your understanding, reframe your approach, um, your state of mind. Um, that's what I'm hoping to uh, do. So here's my little catchphrase. Crisis invites us to reinvent, which leads to joy. So often is the case that in photography, as we go through and we learn new things, we hit a crisis. And then we have to try to figure out how to get beyond that problem, work it, and get to the other side. And when we do get to the other side successfully, it usually brings us joy. My first crisis happened when I had a um, very early job in my career. I was a full-time student in college, and I'd gotten a job at the Milwaukee Journal as a photographer. And they had this uh, assignment editor who was this old cranky guy that sat at this big radio desk. And he called me in there one day and said, Racy, you're going to have to do this horrible assignment. And I was like, whatever it is, I'll take it. I'm so excited to be here. I'm, I'm great, you know. He says, you're going to have to go cover this horrible rock concert. It's going to be this big traffic jam. You're probably going to miss deadlines. It'll probably never even make the paper, but you got to go. And I said, well, who's playing? And they said, the Grateful Dead. I said, sweet. That's awesome. So what right away, when they told me where it was and what time it was, and I knew the deadline for the newspaper, I knew I was doomed. And so I went to the editor of that section of the paper, and I said, there is no way to get out of Alpine Valley Music Theater and get back downtown to Milwaukee in time to get this in the paper. The only way to do this is to use a helicopter. And so I said, you know, I don't know what you got in your budget, but if you want this picture, you're going to have to rent me a helicopter. And so this was, of course, two days before the event. And so she said, well, why don't you find out what it costs? And I called everybody, and there was only one possible thing. All of them were booked. And uh, so basically what happened is this... Um, this guy called me back from this rental place and said, well, here's the thing. We don't have any available, but we have one guy that's going there already. But we're trying to get a hold of him to ask if he'd be willing to let you come. But it's only one person. It's a five-seat helicopter, you know. So if he'll be allowed you to do that, then you can go. And so I kind of was sweating bullets and thinking, well, I'd love to go to the show. I want to see the Grateful Dead. And um, so anyway, the day before, like 5 o'clock, the call comes. Hey, the guy said it's all right. And I said, sweet. So I get my stuff. I drive to the airport the next day, and I wait, and I wait, and I wait. And the time that I'm supposed to, like, the time that we're supposed to take off has come and gone. And I'm thinking, this is never going to happen. Something's wrong. And it wasn't really my rental anyway. And so ultimately, finally, this big limousine pulls up. And who gets out but Jerry Garcia? <laughs> no lie. And uh, sometimes I lie, and I'll tell you when I do. But this is not a lie. <laughs> So I am so excited because I'm going to meet Jerry Garcia. This is awesome. I'm so pumped. And so I get in there and I get all strapped in and i am got my headphones on and he looks at me and says, you can call me Jerry. And I was like, wow, you know, this is awesome. And that's when I realized that the equipment that I had with me was perfect for what I thought I was going to do. I had a Nikon 400 millimeter 2.8 lens, <laughs> one body and four rolls of film in my pocket. And Jerry was right here. <laughs> and the pilot that brought us in, true story, the pilot that brought us in um, was a Vietnam veteran. And Jerry says, hey, man, you're in the Nam? And the guy says, yeah. He's, can we take a look kind of close? And the guy says, sure. Sure, Jerry. So he, like, gets us in, and, and we bank. And so now I'm looking at Jerry down here. And through the bubble window, I see the, the whole stage and all the people and I can't make the picture. So the first rule I've learned was never go anywhere without a wide angle lens. <laughs> so please learn from my mistakes. But it, it was good because after that I had to reframe. I had to think about what that crisis was, how to get beyond it, and that was it. My next crisis involved, I had been working at the Milwaukee Journal for a long time. I graduated from college. I was so excited to try and find a real job. Um, and I was going to leave Milwaukee, and I was going to go all the way down to sunny West Palm Beach to work at the Palm Beach Post. But there was a crisis coming that I wasn't really aware of yet, and that was that I had to learn how to expose color transparency film. And I'd been shooting only black and white. So 
Black and white, you got lots of fudge factor. You can mess up your exposures and you can still get a print out of it okay. Color slide film, not so much. And so I had to really work at that. I had to really, really learn how to work with an incident light meter, how to read light, how to kind of like, even you feel the wind in your face and you know that the wind is blowing, so you gotta look at the clouds, what's gonna happen when. It all becomes like one thing. And it took me a long time to figure out how to expose film properly. The next thing I had to do, the next crisis I had to deal with was learning how to use strobes. So back before we had digital cameras, we didn't have anything in the back that showed you a preview. And the newspapers I worked for were too cheap to let us buy Polaroid. So we had to basically use invisible light and practice, practice, practice every day. And we had to make this light that we couldn't see. The flash would go off and we just had to imagine what it was. And by trial and error, we ultimately got joy from seeing our pictures that worked. So the next crisis was unhappiness because I realized that newspaper photography, while it was fun and afforded me lots of opportunities to learn new things and see stuff and shoot all kinds of different kinds of jobs, I really was not impressed. And it was a very demeaning sort of uh, job and it was getting worse it seemed and I wanted out. I wanted to get it, I wanted to get the magazines. And so, in wanting to get out, I had to consider the crisis that was besetting me, and I had to try to figure out how can I reinvent myself in order to get rid of this existence and get into the one that I want. And so I realized that it was up to me. So I started shooting the business, the boring stockbroker business picture for the business section that would run as a postage stamp. I would use that as an opportunity to go shoot for Forbes magazine or Money or Inc., and when I got a, an assignment to do a high school athlete that was a standout, I would go and arm myself with everything that I could think of that a Sports Illustrated photographer would go and do that portrait with. Same thing when I was working photojournalism covering news, I would think, all right, what would Time Magazine run? What would they put on the cover? How would I get a double truck? What would I do to get that space rate? Um, so in order to get to the next level, your pictures have to be there already. So it's very interesting, like a lot of times people struggle with what should I put in a portfolio? You should put in a portfolio what your trajectory is. A lot of people put in their portfolio what they have already done. Now if what you've already done is exactly what you wanna continue doing, that's okay. But if you wanna to move to the next level and go and, and kinda of reinvent yourself and push, you've got to actually have the pictures in advance, which is why I was doing all these crazy things at a newspaper. All the other staffers thought I was crazy. I kept getting this question, when are you gonna start doing video? Over and over and over again from good clients. And finally I realized, you know, it's time. It's time for me to do this. And so this is where I step into mirrorless for the very first time. And mirrorless was, and still to a certain extent, is um, a transitional time for me. I still use DSLRs sometimes for sporting events, uh, for the super long lenses. Um, but I am totally committed to being mirrorless forever and always, eventually. That's all I want to do, but it's, I'm just waiting for the gear to catch up to what I want to do. Um, so here's an issue. DSLRs lie to you every time you use them. They lie. They are, when you look in the viewfinder, you pick one up off a table and you put it to your eye, it shows a perfect exposure every time. It shows you perfect light balance, your auto white balance in your, in your retina and your eye, it's perfect all the time. Um, it is really an interesting thing to be thinking about lenses. If you know much about photography, you know that when you use macro lens and you get really far away from the focal plane, the lens starts to slow down and it loses speed, right? So every lens that's made for DSLR is by default actually faster than it really is. But by the time the light has to get through the mirror box all the way to the focal plane, you've already lost. But you had to pay for the optic that they had to make to punch through that movie theater of a hole. It's kind of crazy. So what good are ultra-fast lenses if you can't focus them? I remember getting my 85 1.2L lens for the first time. It was so amazing. Um, but I ultimately ended up shooting it almost always at F2 because I couldn't really judge focus between eye and iris and retina. I mean, I couldn't do that. It just it wasn't precise enough. And when I finally got to DSLR out of there and got to mirrorless, all of a sudden, I could literally pick. I could see it in the viewfinder what I needed to do. It was awesome. Another advantage with the autofocus system is there's no predictive AF. 
the, the mirrorless cameras don't have to predict because there's no mirror flapping up and down all the time. There's nothing blocking the sensor from seeing through the lens. It's constantly always seeing. And so you don't have this kind of adjustment where you get a, a bad frame every once in a while. Um, DSLR lenses are very heavy, they're costly, and they're bulky. They weigh a ton. And what's funny right now, it's not funny actually, it's kind of sad, but a lot of the legacy lenses that were made for film, the chips are now outrunning them big time. So you've got this great, oh, I gotta have the latest camera, the latest chip, 50 megapixel, whatever. But then when you take your lens that was made in 96 and you put it on there, it doesn't quite give you the results that you might want. So the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Uh, having no mirror allows for a completely silent shutter, an electronic shutter. This has really changed the way we can approach golf. We've had to reframe the courtroom, uh, the ballet, the symphony, going to church, and certainly shooting on TV shows on set. All of a sudden, the still photographer shoot all the time at five frames a second and never bother anyone. Lighter weight, more compact. I had to literally scrap all my bags and cases because none of them fit because they were huge. There's these huge cavernous things. I had to get like shrinky dink bags and everything had to change because my mirrorless equipment was so small. Being able to see in the dark. Sometimes we get stuck in these wedding receptions where it's like candlelight or this. somebody gets a great idea. Hey, let's turn the lights off and use those glow things around our necks. Well, that's great until you have to focus. Um, but with mirrorless, especially the Sony A7 series, it's amazing. They see in the dark. And you can use focus peaking. Um, and you can know. I used to bracket focus you know, with, with wedding receptions. You just, you just kind of like that. And then you figure, well, I got one in there somewhere. I know I did. But now I can shoot one frame and move on. And I also know if they blinked or not, because I saw it already. So what you see is what you get. And chimping is a waste of time. Chimping is a, a sports term. I'm not sure if it's made it into the mainstream, but it's where you are ch looking at the back of the camera all the time. You don't need to do that. When you're looking what the chip sees all the time, 100% of the time, there's no need to look at it and preview it. I turn it off on all my cameras. Um, it totally changes concert and event photography because you're always, the light's changing. It's blue now, it's red now, it's green now, it's yellow. Now the big crowd lights come on. You're able to keep up with these changing exposures, no problem, because you are seeing what the chip is seeing at all times. So I'm not overshooting like I used to do, and I don't delete 16 pictures at a time because I have a fast motor drive. I'm actually able to shoot exactly what I need. Um, one of the big things, differences between um, DSLRs and uh, the A7 series mirrorless cameras from Sony is the EVF is so awesome. And a lot of people judge, they misjudge, they think they know what mirrorless is because they're looking at the back of the camera all the time where there's 800,000 pixels instead of 2.4 or 2.8 million pixels in the EVF. So you gotta try these things, they're really amazing. And last, you know, one of the first lenses I bought when I got my A7, this might surprise you, I bought an, a, an Olympus 21 millimeter F2. I had seen a photograph when I was in college that uh, David Turnley shot with that lens and it was so awesome and I could not duplicate it. I finally tracked him down in Fort Wayne, Indiana on the phone. I talked to his mom and then she gave me his number and I was able to figure out who he was and stuff. And he told me what the lens was. Because Sony is an open mount system, any lens that you have had experience with in your life that you love to have a relationship with, we get emotional about these things. The 105 2.5 uh, Nikon lens, a lot of people love that. Um, I love the 100 F2, you know, that's a great lens. All these lenses are possible to put on your, on your Sony mirrorless camera, so it's really cool. Facial recognition actually works. Did you hear me? It's crazy, but it works. It works awesome. It works for stills. It works great for video. Um, they, there's a new feature. It's kind of new. It's eye tracking. So you get that 85 1.8 Battis lens, and you put it on your A7. You set it for eye tracking, and you can sit in a portrait situation, and the camera only pays attention to the eyeball. And I don't know how it does it, but it sees through glasses frames too. So you can like, it's like 99% accurate. It's unbelievable. It makes my job so easy because now I'm not, I'm not looking through like I got that cool, sweet eye candy frame of the portrait, but I have to go find out of the 50 pictures which three are sharp. Now all of them are sharp. It's great. Um, again, same autofocus performance with stills as in video, which is kind of crazy. Internal 4K capture. 
this just happened to me a little bit ago. I, um, I went and shot a job that this client assured me was video only. All we want is video. So I shot in 4K because I just got a new camera. I was so excited to shoot in 4K for the very first time. And I shot the whole job with, I'm standing in a river shooting this like biologist guy. And he, he like does research on muscles. So he's turning over rocks and it's really cool. I'm right in there and I'm doing all this cool stuff. And I'm getting audio from the Bluetooth microphone system that costs 200 bucks. And everything is going great. And then I'm driving home and the art director calls me and says, hey, geez, we might have to have you go back next week because um, now they want to do something in the magazine, in, in the alumni magazine. And I said, well, let me just check on that. I went back home, went to my office, and pulled still video frame grabs from the video that I'd shot and was able to actually give the magazine more than they needed. The res resolution was very high. Uh, if you're familiar with the old 1D Mark III Canon camera, it was a 10 megapixel professional camera. It was a $5,000 camera. Um, the, when you shoot Sony video on any 4K enabled camera that they make, you get a slightly larger file size out of still frame video grab than a 1D Mark III gave us in 2008. It's amazing. Uh, the other day I was uh, shooting a picture here on the top of Neyland Stadium in my hometown of Knoxville, Tennessee, and I had all these photographers lined up. They only do this once a year. It's a big deal and it didn't rain. Um, last year it rained, so we haven't had a new one of these in three years. And so I'm standing up there with all these people, professional photographers, and uh, I make this picture, and then they all make their picture, and then I get my phone out, and I do a couple things, and I get on my phone, and it's on Instagram. And the guy next to me says, hey, what are you doing? I said, I just wanted to push this out before we climb back down. It was like 38 minutes later that the first images came from the DSLRs that shot the same picture, but they're way behind me. So... Always there's crisis. Always there's crisis. I'm trying to learn video editing right now. And sometimes I just want to shoot myself because I'm just not very good at it yet. But I keep working at it. I keep working at it in my timing and stuff. But every time we meet a crisis in photography, we get to this point where we have this challenge. Are we going to let it beat us or are we going to reinvent ourselves? And when we do that, when we come out on the other side, we can find real joy. Real joy. And... As a photographer, the thing I like most about what I do is the fact that I get to establish relationships with people. I get to know them. There's an intimacy between a photographer and a subject that's really, really cool. And I love that. I thrive on that. And I get a lot of joy from that. And joy needs to lead us all to give back. We need to give back. Uh, you look at me up here today, you don't see Erwin Gebhardt, you don't see Sherman Gessert, you don't see my photojournalism professor, Zoe Smith, you don't see any of these people. But they're all here, they're all in me. Because they poured themselves into me so that I could make pictures for my life. It's up to me now to do what I'm doing here today, which is to give back. And giving back is how we say thank you. Thank you.